Okay, now we're going to do one about African pygmies. We've done one about Negritos recently. Well, actually, it's been about five or six months now, hasn't it? There's been so much in between. But uh, I've also done one about the Khoisan, the early ancient people of the Horn area of Africa versus what's there now today with what people call Ethiopians versus what actually Ethiopians of the Greeks meant and so on. But uh, I said I would do this one too whenever I asked because the, that was a comparison and difference of it of the Negritos, which are this island people way, way east of here, and these Central African people known as pygmies too. A lot of times they get overlooked, and we'll talk about that a little bit here too. Now, when we first go into this, let's make mention, they say, you know, there's goat breeds and pygmy goat and stuff like this. And that's if you want to see that, click on here instead, because that's not what we're talking about. And people realize that we've been able to selectively breed and genetically mess with, but not in a way of a modern thing that you're thinking of, animals to the point of getting very small breeds and very large. In fact, I did one about cowboys and horses and everything, and there's one that you can talk about for like Clydesdales or draft horses can have a foal that's so large that she is bigger as soon as it gets good and stood up, which they do real rapidly too, by the way. They're bigger than some of these mini horses that people have got when they come to an adult. I mean, it's not something like a Welsh pony and it looks like it's just not quite grown up and so on or even a Shetland, which is much smaller than that. But we get into mini ponies at that point too, and so there's been changes. And you can of course see in dogs all the way from something like a Chihuahua to a Great Dane. But that's different than what the causes and effects are looked at as what causes this type of thing. We'll get into that a little bit too. The African pygmies, or Congo pygmies, variously also called Central African foragers, or African rainforest hunter-gatherers, are forest people of Central Africa, are a group of ethnicities native to Central Africa, mostly the Congo Basin, traditionally subsisting on a forager and hunter-gatherer-like lifestyle. They are divided into roughly three geographic groups, the Western Bembenga, or Mbenga, of Cameroon, Gabon, and the Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, are the Eastern Bambuta Mbuti of the Congo Basin, or uh, DRC, which is uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Central and Southern Batwa, or Twa, which are in Rwanda, or Burundi, uh, DRC, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, Angola, and Namibia. The more widely scattered and more variable physiology and lifestyle. Southern Twa are also grouped under the Troom terms pygmoid. And so if you look at this map here, we'll click to it and then back, you can see, and it actually says on here, the Southern Twa are not shown, but I believe these, in fact, here it is, Twa, Twa, there are the Southern Twa, and this is Burundi. I have a little bit of knowledge for this area here. I used to order special exotic fish, hand-caught out of this lake, there are certain cichlids. This is Lake Tanganyika. This is Malawi down there that's just puking up. But then this is Victoria and so on. And hey, it leads up to the Nile up there. But, um, you know, Dr. Livingston, I presume, and so on. There are, in fact, Livingstone eyes stonefish that are in here. And there's an oddity to the fish where he uh, gets blotchy and looks like he's going to die and real stressed out. And fish will come up to peck on him and he gets up and eats him real quick. And he's like, haha. But so it's like a living stone, but then no, 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 he was named after Dr. Livingston. It's one of the cool fish from there. So anyhow, uh, and there was a little bitty shell dweller fish. It dwells inside big snail shells. But this is a little bitty fish, uh, an inch long, inch and a half at the most, called a shell dweller, that uh, Cadiopunctatus. It's a Latin name, by the way. But it lived up here north of that, and they had to deal with these people to get it. And he told me that they dealt with them, and they would uh, give them their children's clothes when they outgrew them. That they were that small to them, and he said he wasn't a tall man. And that's the guy that I dealt with that was right up in here. We dealt with Burundi a little bit, but what we dealt with mostly was a place called Bulu Point. 
and there's a couple of others down to curry and stuff like that but so there are different people and there's Aka and Baka and it talks about how Ba actually means a people and so on so this probably really is closely extremely related but separated now in their variants and so you get this Ka version then they're green but then there's the Twa and Kwa version of that and then Bongo the Baka and then this Asua and Efe slightly version that are called Mbuti. It leads over here to the coast but from the coast to Central Africa and they were all the way through the Central Africa and up the top of Great Lakes area. Right? Okay. So, so we're well below the Sahara. The Sahara is up at the top of the map here basically and goes for almost as thick as the map is again up and pretty much impassable and then it starts to be up to the edge of the Mediterranean as we know it. <clears throat> they are notable for and named for their short stature Described as pygmyism in anthropological literature, they are assumed to be descended from the original Middle Stone Age expansion anatomically modern humans to Central Africa, albeit substantially affected by later migrations from West Africa from their first appearance in the historical record in the 19th century, limited to a comparative small area within Central Africa greatly decimated by the prehistoric Bantu expansion. When we look at the Bantu expansion here, we can see where this is where the Bantu type people, this is the people of the slave trades and so on, and where they had run down through over their time. And you can see they started out over there also somewhat similar of an area, and then across and through and down. So they didn't go up or towards Egypt or even towards the Mediterranean. That happened later because of other reasons, right? and to the present time widely affected by enslavement and cannibalism at the hands of neighboring Bantu groups. So the, the Bantu people are the people that are pretty much the uh, people that were enslaved in the Islamic slave trade through and uh, also for the North American slave trade were like 92 percent went to South America and up to the North America and so on like that those people most of that type of group. So <clears throat> they've been widely affected by the Bantu expansion because I guess they were there and Bantus were only over in that small spot, right? But as they came through, them being of small stature, I guess they easily were able to enslave them and they caused cannibalism and so on by Bantu groups. Now, most contemporary pygmy groups are only partially foragers and partially trade with neighboring farmers to acquire cultivated foods and other material items. No group lives deep in the forest without access to agricultural products now. As a total number of about 900,000 pygmies were estimated to be living in the Central African forest in 2016, about 60% of this number in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The number does not include the southern Twa populations who live outside of the Central Africa forest environment. So, I've got to click on here. Well, yeah, it is the green spots that we were looking at in the lower part, so... <clears throat> but they're saying the numbers don't figure in that, so it's even higher, I guess. But what's odd about this, they were saying that in 2016, but I swear the 2017 number said that there was 500,000 total. They weren't leaving out the Southern Twa. I think you'll see that here in a minute. Who live outside of that area, right? So the Twa live out of the exacting certain areas. Now, they say that they've been impinged upon or whatever, and uh, quite often by the Bantu type people. But if you look here, they're wearing westernized clothes now, but you can still see them putting on grass skirts and so on. And, of course, the westernized clothes is a more recent thing. <clears throat> you can see kind of their phenotype looks very familiar the only thing that's an oddity about it is if you put somebody else like a, put a white man out there or something you see how much of a difference they have over them for they only come up above the belt very much these people are only about four foot tall some are under three and a half so on yeah so you a wide variation there. You can get somebody like Shaq and put them there, and it's like they're they're not even half his height. Literally. 
and uh, what's the next picture? So this is one of them. They, so they live in this bush area, all out, and uh, these are all modern clothing that you see them with here, and then that's her kid, and uh, it's a pretty young kid. Hmm. It's got to be hard having a have Bantu kid whenever you're that size too. That's got to be incredible. Let's see. Most contemporary pygmy groups are only partial foragers, they told you about them. And the southern Twa population who live outside of the African uh, in partially open swamps are desert environments. Hmm. So they're living in a different environment than the rest of them. But there's outliers. Let's just say it like that. <clears throat> now this is recent, of course, but this is pretty recent too. This is 1942, and this is what you would have seen in that same area in 42 with the loincloth or not. And uh, this is a father and son pygmy, and you can see them holding the spears here. And the son's pygmy is just knocked off smaller, and you think, oh, okay, well, no, that pygmy spear right there, if you were held on to it, would actually uh, not coming up, you know, to your chin. Yeah, you'd need a couple of feet longer on that to make it a correct throwing spear for your type size. Although the blade's about the right size, and there's probably a reason for that. So you can see them here, and clearly the phenotype of it. And here's a good example where you can get the idea of a size and difference. For that's his belt right here, at about her ear, and about his shoulder or armpit. So he's breaking four foot, ish. And she ain't, and he's maybe close to six foot with his boots on. So, let's go back here to it real quick. The term pygmy is used to refer to diminutive people. It derives from Greek pygmaeus, for Latin pygmaeus, plural pygmaei, or pygmy, in term for dwarf from Greek mythology. Now, this is... That's why I said it at first. This is not what we're talking about. It's something that we would have recently called a midget or something we now call little people. For they all have this trait. The thing that would be weird is if one of them had a midget. I mean, well, let's not go there. Um, so it's a term for dwarf in Greek mythology. And we learned about, about dwarfs. The dwarf word is derived from pygma, which is a term for cubit. Like pyramid and pygma and cubit literally means fist this term for it so it's basically saying well you know cubit's that big well it's only that big versus the whole thing in other words saying a smaller portion or suggesting a diminutive height the use of pygmy in reference to the small framed African hunter gathers deals to the early 19th century in England First, by John Barrow, travers into the interior of southern Africa in 1806. So this is one of the first times they were actually cartographed and reported. Before that, there were some hearings about it, and hey, there's some people that are this tall, and so on. However, the term was used diffusely and treated as unstantiated claims of dwarf tribes among the bushmen of the interior of Africa. So these are, again, bushmen when we're looking at it. We're actually looking at the people of the slave trade type of person and not actually that smaller people. In fact, she almost looks Khoisanish, but that's another people that aren't related entirely. So, until the exploration of the Congo Basin in the 1870s, a commentator writing in 1892 claimed that 30 years ago, or in the 1860s, nobody believed in the existence of African dwarf tribes and that it needed an authority like Dr. Schwerzenforth that pygmies actually did exist in Africa. Re referencing George August Schwenforth's Heart of Africa, published in 1873. So in other words, people still didn't believe it at that late of a date, and it was only believed finally whenever people finally corroborated it again. African pygmy is used to referencing... Uh, for disambiguation for Asiatic pygmy, a name applied for the Negrito populations of Southeast Asia. And I did do a video about that, and you can see them standing here and then the other white men standing behind them, and how they actually are a little taller than these guys are here that we're currently talking about, 
but uh, they're also not related. There are more island type people, Asiatic Islanders. Debner, 1996, reported a universal disdain for the term pygmy, so I guess it's turned bad too now because somebody's saying that it's, it's, you know, a term about short people, so how could you possibly make something that would be definitive that people would, whatever. The term is considered pejorative, and people prefer to be referred to the name of their respected ethnic or tribal groups, such as Baca, Matui, and Twa. Okay, but people don't know what you're talking about, and you go, hey, you know those, the Twa and the Matui, the, the pygmy people? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So, I mean, is that okay? What? Uh, some of this you just really have, never mind. There is no clear replacement for the term pygmy in reference to the umbrella group. That's what I'm saying. A descriptive term that has seen some use since the 2000s is Central African foragers. But then, okay, we got that. But then you go the Central African foragers. What are you talking about? Or the Bantu people? And you go, no, 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 the pygmies. And they go, oh, okay, yeah. So it's the same situation. Unless you want to put them really out there in public a whole lot. And we're trying to keep from that somewhat and keep people somewhat non-westernized so much but it just just doesn't happen once they've been exposed to people that have all this advancement onto them it's near impossible you understand <clears throat> regional names used collectively of the western group of pygmies are called bambinga or imbinga the plural form of imbinga is bambinga they're saying and used in the congo language and bayaka the plural form of ayaka used in the central african public but there's the fish that we used to get also. They're called imbuna. And so it's like the imbinga. And so what does this mean? Well, it's the plural form of these imbuna fish, apparently. And imbuna were all different kinds. It's weird, but they're are cool looking fish. But they generally all get the same size, but they have different color patterns on them. They almost look like the exact same thing, but they're different colors and stripes and things like that onto them. And you put them in with limestone, holy rock and stuff, and they're pretty easy to keep as long as you keep the pH up pretty good. Now they've been bred in captivity in Florida fish farms and things for so many generations they're even more tolerant, but let's continue. So there's different groups. The Congo pygmy speak languages of the Niger Congo in Central Sudanic languages. There has been significant intermixing between the Bantu and the Pygmies. Hmm. There's at least a dozen pygmy groups, sometimes unrelated to each other. They are grouped in three geographic categories, and we talked about those a minute ago with the Ambuta and then Great Lakes Twa and everything. I even told you about Great Lakes stuff. But uh uh, the Pygmoid Southern Twa, uh, not always included in the term pygmy, as they tend to be somewhat taller, male, male average about 155 centimeters, so they're well over four foot. Subgroups include Ichuya Twa, Mongo Lake, Lake Twa, and Kafe Twa. So it makes you wonder whenever they're mixing back here, there's got to be some back into other uh, West African groups. And that's why you might see Kevin Hart and somebody that's just over five foot perhaps, but then in an average of being just, you know, in the high five-footer range to six, but then you'll see basketball players a totally different, and then the variation that's in between that. It's a little farther than somebody saying, well, uh, that guy's tall, and he's a head taller than you, and this, that, and the other. You get some variances that show in that, and that's also characteristic of things that are working out and popping up in genetics, too, but let's not go there. The origins. African pygmies are often assumed to be the oldest or the direct descendants of the Middle Stone Age hunter-gatherer peoples of the Central African rainforest. Genetic evidence for the deep separation between them of Congo pygmies from the lineage of West Africans and East Africans, which are all different, <clears throat> as well as admixture from the archaic humans. So it's, they're saying someone totally different applying admixture to them, was found in the 2010s. The lineage of African pygmies is strongly associated with mitochondrial line haplogroup L1 with a divergence time between 170,000 and 100,000 years ago. And so 
Well, if you look at their haplogroup and the haplotype that they have off of it and their structural cranial form of what we would call West Africans now, it would be like Negroid. The oldest found Negroid is Asilar Man at 4400 BC. They found other ones before that, but they're all proto forms. And so by that collation, you can tell that they're talking about something that was anatomically modern humans. Not a normal human, as we think about it, but there was admixture from archaic humans, which is back lineage admixture we've talked about in other videos. They were partially absorbed or displaced by later immigration of agricultural peoples of Central Sudamic and Ubangian phyla beginning after about 5,500 years ago and beginning about 3,500 years ago by the Bantu adopting their languages. So this is shortly after their formation, if you will, off that. And they found earlier skulls, and you think, well, easily want to push that 4,400 B.C. date is a skull that's older than that, but they have found a bunch of them, but they're already a proto-form, and the oldest one that's even that form at all, that they've found at all, is 9100 B.C. at Iwaliru. So, we're talking about something before that form. A lot of people think that, well, it's got to be a Homo erectus then, but we don't and they say there's a ghost hominid integration with these people. And they'd say, well, they don't have a sample of Homo erectus or any other hominid at this point that we have that matches it. So they say it's an unknown ghost hominid. It's like 18-19% average, they've said, in some of these groups. Uh, linguistic substrates. Substantial non-Bantu and non-Ubangian substrates have been identified in Aka and Baka, respectively, on the order of 30% of the lexicon. Much of this vocabulary is botanical, deals with honey harvesting, or is otherwise specialized for the forest, and is shared between the two Western pygmy groups. In other words, they have a language before that they have kept most of the words for, other things they didn't, and a major portion of their linguistics was adopted. So this substrate has been suggested as representing a remnant of an ancient western pygmy linguistic phylum, dubbed Membinga or Baka. However, as the substrate vocabulary has been widely borrowed between pygmies and neighboring peoples, no reconstruction of such a Baka language is possible for times more remote than a few centuries ago. In other words, it's changed so much from just what it was a few centuries ago in the primitive linguistics that they used to have compared to what they have now, that there's nobody left that they've been in touch with that would have something that they would say, uh, this is more of that oldest language. An ancestral pygmy language has been postulated for at least some pygmy groups based on the observation of linguistic substrates. According to Merritt Ruland in 1994, African pygmies speak languages belonging either to the Nilo-Saharan or the niger Cork a fine family. It's assumed that pygmies once spoke their own languages, but that through living in symbiosis with other Africans and crisscrossing and being stuck in the middle of Central Africa there, in prehistoric times they adopted languages belonging to these two families. By prehistoric, they don't mean back in dinosaur things. They mean just recently because they don't have a history of record that goes back like other people do in this area. Roger Blinch, 1997 and 1999, criticized the hypothesis of ancestral pygmy languages, arguing that even if there's evidence for a common ancestral language rather than just borrowing, it will not be su sufficient to establish a specific pygmy origin rather than that of several potential language isolates of former hunter gatherer populations that ring the rainforest. So in other words, they can't trace it back like they can the uh, Proto-Indo-European Aryan languages and linguistics and even get a postulatory like that. It just dies off like no telling what, just a couple of centuries what it was like, much less something archaic. He argued, though, that the short stature of pygmy populations can arise relatively quickly in less than a few millennia 
under strong selective pressures. But would that be, see there are different African populations where you'll see where the men are fairly small and the women are fairly big and they have big butts on them and stytopegy and things like this and there are other ones that don't and that's from selective breeding and things like that so they're saying when well, you can go a couple of centuries off of it and start getting exaggerations but you'd have to be exaggerating for the smallest of people and doing things like that and the reality of this doesn't seem like it points that way let's go on here <coughs> Sorry, genetic studies he found evidence for the African pygmies being descended from the Middle Stone Age peopling of Central Africa with a separation time from West and East Africans in the order of 130,000 years. So, in way back machine. African pygmies in the historical period have been significantly displaced by assimilated in several waves of Niger-Congo speakers of the Central Sudanic, Ubangian, and Bantu phylo. So genetically, African pygmies have some key differences between them and Bantu peoples. African pygmies' uniparental markers display the most ancient divergence from other human groups among anatomically modern humans. So they've been, they have something that hasn't been impinged on back and forth as part of their stuff. There's only one that's older than that, and I did a video on it not too long ago, but... Um, so, second most, second only to those who displayed among the Khoisan populations I did the video about. Researchers identified an ancestral and autochthonous lineage of MTTA shared by Pygmies and Bantu, suggesting that both populations were originally one and that they were started to diverge from common ancestors around 70,000 years ago, still in the Wayback Machine, after a period of isolation, during which current phenotype differences between pygmies and Bantu farmers accumulated, pygmy women started marrying Bantu farmers, but not the opposite. Uh huh. And this trend started around 40,000 years ago or so out of the 70 and continued until several thousand years ago. Subsequently, the pygmy gene pool was not enriched by external gene influxes. Hmm. Mitochondrial haplogroup L1C is strongly associated with these pygmies, especially with Bimbinga groups. L1C prevalence was variously reported as 100% in Bacola, 97 in Aka, 77 in Biaka, 100% in the Bezden, 90 and 100% in the Baka people of Gabun and Cameroon, respectively, 97% in Bioka, and 82 in Ba Vongo. Mitochondrial haplogroups L2A and LOA are prevalent among the Bambuti, and that shows the integration that going on there. Peyton and others in 2009 suggested two unique Pleistocene before 60,000 years ago divergences from other human populations and a split between Eastern and Western pygmy groups even at about 20,000 years ago that are already 70,000 years convergent from either of the groups that are surrounding them after this point. Various hypotheses have been pro proposed to explain this short stature of African pygmies. Becker and others suggest African pygmyism may have evolved as an adaptation to the significantly lower average levels of ultraviolet light available beneath the canopy of the rainforest environments. Now, a lot of people think about Sub-Saharan Africa, and they would say, what, what are you talking about? Like, uh, hiding under a bush or something? No, there's the jungle environment there. In fact, that's why they believe they have the darkened skin, because they would fade into shadows. There's actually, in the environments they are in, it gives them no benefit to hide from the sun even more when their skin doesn't absorb it, like the Caucasian skin will absorb it very easily being white, and then hand to a point where it can reject a certain amount of it whereas these people need to get a certain amount of sun if they don't they can get rickets and things which is where your bones don't form as well and vitamin D and the things that go along with calcium and strontium and magnesium in your diet iodine and things else come into play let's go on 
So UV lights in hiding in the canopy of rainforest environments in similar hypothetical serine areas because of reduced access to sunlight and comparatively smaller amounts of anatomically formulated vitamin D is produced, resulting in restricted dietary calcium uptake and subsequently restricted bone growth and maintenance, resulting in an overall population average skeletal mass near the lowest periphery of the spectrum among anatomically modern humans. So if you follow that, that's basically what I was saying there. And then due to their diets lacking, and we'll talk about that just a hair here and go on. Other proposed explanations include potentially less or available uh, availability of protein-rich food sources in rainforest environments. They often reduce soil calcium levels that are in rainforest environments and the caloric expenditure required to traverse rainforest terrain, insular dwarfism is an adaptation to equatorial and tropical heat and humidity. And so this may be a thing that you see back and forth with the Negritos, which aren't related to these guys, but pulling off something that's very similar. They call this convergence, where two things are unrelated but end up about the same point. So, insular dwarfism is an adaptation to equatorial and tropical heat and humidity, and pygmaism is an adaptation associated with rapid reproductive maturation under conditions of early mortality. Now, what that's saying is they don't live a long life, but therefore they end up maturing a little bit earlier, growing up a little bit earlier, have a heightened testosterone level in males and so on like this and this, so it allows for the same factors if you will and then because they mature at a smaller age and younger age they never do get to their full height. There's more to it than that though. Additional evidence suggests that when compared to other sub-Saharan African populations, African pygmy populations display unusually low levels of expression of the genes encoding for human growth hormone and its receptor associated with low serum levels of insulin like growth factor 1 in short stature. And insulin is hooked up with sugars and things like that you know about it going with diabetes and everything in fact you take a person that's used to feeding so slight like this and start shoving some kind of American foods in them there's no wonder there's a lot of diabetes and obesity and things like that but let's go on we don't want to talk about all this right here, but a study by Price and others provides insight in the role genetics plays in the reduced stature of African pygmies. And in this right here, he talks about how they have seemingly in their genetics something that's messing with their thyroid and insular growth factor that goes on, especially with Mbuti and other ones. By contrast, they see other ranges, and it has to do with um, iodine and with thyroid problems and things like that and they say well you know whenever somebody has a thyroid problem they get a goiter it usually looks like a lump on their neck you'd think it'd be mumps down on their neck or something but <coughs> supposedly my dad had one when he was a kid about seven or eight and they ended up giving him some iodine stuff and he ate certain kinds of foods and there was nothing after that big deal although late in life he did have some thyroid problems nah, it... anyhow so they're saying this iodine deficient diet can cause a problem with thyroids and they suggest that the signals of the receptive section of high thyroid hormone pathways can cause short stature over and above that. This is along with studies that people have done for like why did those elephants turn into pygmies elephants on that little island whenever there wasn't somebody to make a short horse out of it. They just automatically did. Well, they're, they're trapped on that island and their food sources compared to the variety they used to have and then all this calcium and things that they weren't getting before and it drove them to end up being driven to a pygmy form, much smaller. So are these people trapped in one certain area but living off a certain type of foods and that's what's doing it to them? And it drove down in a certain way? 
you know, there's dwarves and elves and things like that in Dungeons and Dragons, and I've often made the comments in other videos for how that works out and how somebody can get that short stature situation from going through a trauma and droughts and all that stuff, and it'll start working its way, and you get some five, five foot five people at most, and then you get some six, six foot six people, and they call them giants, but whenever they merge together, they turn around and go, yeah, you and I, we killed the giants, right? And how mythology works through that, but let's just continue. <coughs> the African pygmies are particularly known for vocal music, usually characterized, <coughs> pardon me, I decided to get some of this juice and it gives me such a glick in my mouth. <sighs> like taking another drink is going to fix it. Usually characterized by dense quadrupuntal improvisation, Sama Aram says that the level of polyphoronic complexity of pygmy music was reached in Europe in the 14th century, yet pygmy culture is unwritten in ancient sub-pygmy groups being the first known cultures in some areas of Africa. So they predate a lot of the other ones, but then they've taken on the phenotype situation of other. Music permeates daily life with songs of entertainment, special events, and communal activities. Polyphonic music is found among the Aka, Baka, and the Mbuti, but not among the Gaeli or Kola are the various groups of Twa. So the other ones are the only one that has the music thing effect going into it. So, now we go to contemporary issues in the society, enslavement and genocide. In the Republic of Congo, where pygmies make up 2% of the population, many pygmies live as slaves to their Bantu masters. The nation is deeply stratified between these two major ethnic groups. The pygmy slaves belong from birth to their Bantu masters in a relationship that Bantus call a uh, time-honored tradition. Really? Even though the pygmies are responsible for much of the hunting, fishing, and manual labor in the jungle villages, pygmies are, and Bantus alike say pygmies are often paid at the master's whim perhaps in cigarettes, used clothing, or even nothing at all. As a result from a pressure from UNICEF and human rights activities, a law that would grant special protections to the pygmy people is awaiting a vote by the Congo Parliament. Well, I hope that's already gone through now, although this is a recent update to the article here, and so I'm guessing this is going on in a modern day still. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, during the Ituri conflict, Ugandan-backed rebel groups were accused by the UN of enslaving Mbutus to prospect for minerals and to forage for forest food for them, uh, with those returning empty-handed being killed and eaten. In 2003, Senafasi Murakello, a representative of Mbutu Pygmies, told the UN's Indigenous People Forum that during the Congo Civil War, his people were hunted down and eaten as though they were game animals. In neighboring North Kivu province, there has been cannibalism by a death squad known as La Fissures, or the Erasers, who wanted to clear the land of people and open it up for mineral exploration or exploitation. Both sides of the war regarded them as subhuman, and some say their flesh can confer magical powers. I also think that about albinos, if you look into it. Markello asked for the UN Security Council to recognize cannibalism as a crime against humanity and an act of genocide. According to minority rights in the Group International, there is extensive evidence of mass killings, cannibalisms, and rape of pygmies, and they have urged the International Criminal Court to investigate a campaign of extermination against pygmies, through which they have been targeted by virtually all the armed groups. Much of the violence against pygmies is attributed to the rebel group, the Movement for the Liberation of Congo, which is part of the transitional government, hmm, transitioning to what, and still controls much of the North and their allies. In northern Katanga province, starting in 2013, the Pygmy Batwa people, uh, whom, whom the Luba people often exploit and allegedly enslave, rose up into militias such as the Percy militia and attacked Luba villages. Luba militia, known as elements, attacked back. 
notably killing at least 30 people in the Voluma 1 displaced people camp in April 2015. Since the start of the conflict, hundreds have been killed and tens of thousands have been displaced from their homes. The weapons used in the conflict are often arrows and axes rather than guns. So it's like the Rwandan thing whenever they came in with weapons. So systematic discrimination. So let's take a look at these thing, pictures right here and take a look at the things they have all around here and look. So you can see he's got modern clothing on now, but they live in these little huts that they bend over sticks and put leaves all over the top of. And there's a kid there. Uh, there's one too. So they're pretty much naked in there. And there's a fire going, a little smoke going up. And they do have a modern water can, it looks like. Not much other convenience. Looks like, I don't know, less than Gilligan's Island for sure, huh? She took the clothes in the bucket away. They've always been viewed as inferior by both the village-dwelling Bantu tribes and colonial authorities. This has translated into systematic discrimination. One early example was the capture of pygmy children under the auspices of the Belgian authorities who exported pygmy children to zoos throughout Europe, including the World's Fair in the United States in 1907. Look, that... I, I, if this is what I'm talking about here, there was just like seven people at most of it, and they ran around the world getting treated like a king. And then uh, I guess the bad part was that they got brought back. Pygmies are often evicted from their land and given lowest-paying jobs at state level. Pygmies are not considered citizens by most African states and refused identity cards. That's odd because they really apparently owned all of Central Africa for up until recently. Deforestation has exasperated this problem by forcing pygmies out of their traditional homelands and into villages and cities where they're often marginalized, impoverished, and abused by the dominant culture. There are roughly 500,000 pygmies left in the rainforest of Central Africa. Well, that was 900,000 before. So just in a series of a few years, they've lost 400,000. Oh, wait, the other one said they weren't counting the Twa thing. Here, it doesn't make that distinction. The population is rapidly decreasing as poverty intermarriage with Bantu peoples. Westernization and deforestation gradually destroy their way of life and culture. The greatest environmental problem the pygmies face is the loss of their traditional homeland of tropical forests of Central Africa. In uh, many countries such as Cameroon, Gabon, Central Africa, Republic, and the Republic of Congo, this is due to deforestation and the desire of several governments in Central Africa to evict the pygmies from their forest habitat in order to profit from the sale of everything that comes out of it. This conflict is also violent. Certain groups as the Hutus and the Interwami wish to eliminate the pygmies and take them out of the situation. Since the pygmies rely on the forest for their physical as well as natural survival, because they are just a forest dwelling people, these forests disappear, so do the pygmies. I can go in that, but uh, it does tell you here that um, human rights organization states that forest is receded under logging activities. Also, the shift is brought into the closer contact with the neighboring ethnic communities whose HIV levels are generally higher. This has led to the spread of AIDS into this pygmy group now. Yeah, so um, I don't want to talk about that really anymore, but deforestation has really caused a problem with the situation. I mean, you, not to sound this way at all, but you think about somebody that lives in a forest situation, and you start cutting it down to there's only little clusters of forest left and there's not much left for the people to live in, and then they get marginalized. So this is this other pygmy form of people that are halfway around the world to the Negrito type people that aren't even really related, but they've had similar things happen that caused it. One was trapped on an island with certain diets, the other in a certain area of Africa with a certain diet. And I think that exposes a lot of the truth and reality of things. Like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy.